I would say, say stop being your own gatekeeper. Mm. That's good. Because that, that's what you're doing. Javasia Harris Bowser, and I'm the founder of C. Jane Write, which is both a website and a community for women who write and blog. I'm also the curator of the Reckon Women Voices column. This is a column that each week features an essay by a woman with ties to the South. You can find these essays both on ReckonSouth.com and in the Reckon Women newsletter. C. Jane Wright and Reckon Women partnered back in 2019, and now we have something extra special for you. We've put together a series of interviews with Southern women writers, and we hope that as you get to know more about these women and their work, that it will inspire you to do some writing of your own. In this interview, we're speaking with award-winning poet, Koya Fagan Maples. Koya is a native of Charleston, South Carolina, and currently lives in Birmingham, Alabama. And she's the author of Mend, which is an amazing collection of poetry that really in order to understand the importance and the power of this collection, it requires a bit of a history lesson. So let me take you there for a moment. Dr. James Marion Sims of Mount Meigs, Alabama, is known to many as the father of gynecology. But he was able to do groundbreaking work in this field because between 1845 and 1849, he performed experimental surgeries on at least 11 enslaved women. These women suffered severe vaginal tears due to difficult childbirth. And according to Sims' own records, one woman underwent 30 surgeries. Now, we don't know the names of most of these women, but in Sims' autobiography, he does name three of them, Anarka, Betsy, and Lucy. Through imagined memories and experiences, she is giving voice to the voiceless. So today we are here to talk to Koya about this important story, but also about her writing process and so much more. Hello, Koya. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hello, Javasia. It's good to be here. So before we dive into the questions that I have for you, I was hoping that you could read a piece from your collection, Mend, just to kind of open up this time we have here together. Sure. Um, so this poem is in the voice of Anarka. Um, Anarka was the 17-year-old that Dr. James Marion Sims experimented on the most. Um, she endured at least 30 surgeries um, that were recorded. And um, so this poem is in her voice, even though at this time the women would not have been um, or would not have expressed a lot of agency. Um, I gave Anarka a voice that um, could like implicate and like call the doctor to accounting. Um, and so that's uh, kind of what's happening here in this poem. What yields? First, you'd have to consider us women. Realize our hearts beat under the bush. You'd have to think my heart longed like yours and that my mind wasn't mindless, awash with nothing. To you, I am a hot quaking body, prime material subject. I am only worth what can be gleaned. And you would have to know I meet the pain how your wife would. Imagine her, blushed pink frame, gap legged like, like a birth slick colt, quaking. But you cannot hold both of us in mind at once. My ability to bear is immeasurable. Pain 
discriminates. Material subject. I am rabbit. Thank you so much for reading that. So I wanted to ask you, what inspired you to write this collection about these women and the horror, really, that they endure? When I realized that no records existed that recounted their experiences, uh, the fact that there were 11 women that Sims operated on, but only three were named in his autobiography. The fact that I knew that they had existed, that they had gone through these experience, experiences, but there was nothing to show for it. That frustrated me. It created within me this anxiety to make it right. Um, and so that was the reason why I chose to elevate their voices. Mm -hmm. So in case someone's watching this and they don't quite know what persona poetry is, can you give us a succinct definition of that? Yeah, so poetry is, uh, persona poetry is poetry that is written in the voices of other people or even other things or objects. Um, in this case, this is historical persona poetry. So there's an element of history here. So the writer um, of historical persona poetry aims to be as historically accurate as possible as well in developing that voice. Now with persona poetry that's historical, like yours, there is always gonna be information missing. And of course, with this story in particular, there's so much missing. And so you had to fill in a lot of gaps with imagined experiences, imagined memories. And so how did you go about doing that? Um, what was your inspiration for those imagined memories and experiences that you used to fill in the gaps and really bring these poems to life? So I mentioned the slave narratives. Um, I uh, attained those through the Library of Congress um, and I read slave narratives. I read hundreds of slave narratives. Um, and considering some of those stories and some of those voices really helped to shape the voices of the women and men from the Library of Congress, photos of enslaved people, um, particularly enslaved women, that helped me to develop and distinguish the voices of the collection. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah. So in Mend, in addition to the persona poetry, you also have some poems that are about you and in your own voice. So how did you decide what parts of your personal experience as a woman you would include in this collection? So the goal of Mend was always to convey the women's humanity. And so I knew that I wanted to focus on the fact that they were mothers because I wanted people who read this book to realize their own connection to these women, to not see them as other, um, to not see them as less than human, to not be able to say like, oh, that was during slavery, that was at that time. And so I felt like focusing on their motherhood was, was definitely gonna be the way to um, to convey what I wanted to convey. And so as I was writing this book, I was in the process of writing this book, which it took me six years to write. I became pregnant for the first time and um, I had twins. And so again, like connecting us, um, connecting their experience from years ago to my own experience was really important to me. Um, and so, um, that is kind of what led me to make those decisions about including poems about motherhood. So as I mentioned before, this poetry really does give voice to the voiceless. And when we hear that phrase, we kind of automatically think about activism. So do you feel like poetry can be a form of activism? Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like um, poetry, um, like all other art, um, has led us to the moment that we're currently in. Um, 
And so uh, it is a way to, I mean, poetry is like this innocuous way to inform the population, right? Like you don't expect to go to a reading and see something necessarily revolutionary happening. But the fact that you're being exposed to these ideas um, it, it, it's changing something within you, like it's stirring something within you. Um, and I think that it's definitely influencing our society. It's influencing our culture and it's helping to create change. Mm -hmm. So I want to get a little bit into your writing process because I'm hoping that people watching this will be inspired to write poetry of their own. So um, when you're writing a poem, how do you decide what form it's going to take? How do you decide if it's going to be free verse or more structured? How does that process usually go for you? Yeah, so I just start by just, just writing. Um, and I the structure comes later for me. Um, I don't decide that in advance. Um, I usually kind of come to a place where People say that all poetry, all writing begins with an anxiety, whether that's positive or negative, something is kind of stirring in me. And so what I try to do is just like kind of let that that out. And so I just begin writing um, and I try to kind of um, encapsulate like my feelings, encapsulate the emotion, encapsulate the images that are coming to me that I know that I want to communicate. And then after that is when I worry about structure when I think about my reader and how they might best be able to um, connect with what I've, what I've um, been trying to communicate. So like the, the creative part of it for me is like um, when you make it art is when you consider what would be best for your reader in terms of how they understand the poem. Hmm, okay. So first you just write, you just get it all out. Mm -hmm. all of the images, all the thoughts, all the feelings. And then you think about the structure based on how best you think a reader would read it or take it in. Basically. Right. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what about your writing life in general? Um, I know that you are um, an educator and you can tell us a little bit more about that, but, um, do you write every day? Do you keep a notebook of ideas? Where do you draw inspiration? Just what's your writing life like? So, um, I teach, I just began a new position at the university of Alabama. Um, I teach creative writing in the MFA program there. Um, so beyond that, what my writing life looks like is a lot of reading. Um, a lot of reading. I feel like I read more than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is something that I do daily is, is reading. Um, so writing for me, it looks like a lot of different things. So I have a notebook. I have an actual physical notebook that I write things down in. I try to like use one notebook for like one collection. Um, and so I'll have everything from that collection in that particular notebook and that particular journal. And then I also have the make these lists of words. Mm -hmm. um, and I usually keep those lists, like that list, like in a Google Keep kind of document. And I write down words that are like relevant to um, the subject matter that I'm thinking about. Um, and um, so I do that. And then I also um, listen to a lot of audiobooks too. So because I kind of believe in this, like, um, immersive slash osmosis um, kind of process of like things kind of seeping into your consciousness and then like coming out in your work. Like sometimes I listen to things where that I'm not actively listening to. So like right now I'm listening to a book about tides and the different kind of tides because I'm writing a collection that that is very ocean um, centric. And so I'm just listening to this book and I'm not actively listening, but I'm like hoping that this language and this like this like terminology and these images are like seeping into my brain. And so I do that, too, just as like a practice. And it's kind of like a an informal way of like addressing that that need to write um, and be feeding myself before I can actually like come up with something to to write. 
I love that idea. I've never heard of a writer doing that, but I love that idea so much. <laughs> what kind of advice would you give to someone who writes poetry, but they are worried that it's just not good enough, so they won't share it with anybody? I think purpose. Um, it always it, it always comes back to purpose for me. Like, why did you write it? Um, maybe you did write it just for your personal journal and you don't want to share it with the world. But if you wrote something that could influence someone else and can make someone feel less alone in whatever way, not even a way that that um, it doesn't have to be political. It doesn't have to be um, explicit. It could be something very small. If you wrote in a if you wrote something that can influence someone else positively or make them feel, like I said, any less alone, um, you should share it. You should consider sharing it. I love that. That's honestly one of my favorite things about both reading and writing, that whole idea of a work right. making you feel less alone. I love mm -hmm. that. Um, now, what about people who they are so intimidated by poetry that they won't even write it to begin with. <laughs> so it's not even a fear of showing what they've written, but they're too afraid to even write it. They love poetry. They read it. They listen to it. They go to readings, mm -hmm. but they're so intimidated by it. They won't even try to write it. What would you say to those folks? I would say, say stop being your own gatekeeper. Mm. That's good. Because that, that's what you're doing because you obviously have ascribed to what you feel poetry is. You come up with this idea um, and it's something that's just hindering you, something that's hindering you and you're being your own gatekeeper. So if you wouldn't want anybody else to do that to you, or if you wouldn't want to do that to anybody else, then you shouldn't do it to yourself. Mm, that's good. And I do think some people, a lot of people have this idea of what poetry is and it is this very, you know, lofty, unattainable mm -hmm. thing, I think. So yeah. I, th I think that idea of, like you said, don't be your own gatekeeper. I think that's really powerful. And thank you so much for taking out the time to chat with us today uh, about this very important story and also about your writing process. I'm inspired. I'm about to keep <laughs> my word list. <laughs> and <laughs> and listening to some audiobooks too. So thank you again so much. I really appreciate it. Sure, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that you are as inspired as I am right now. And be sure to tune in next time when we'll be talking to another Southern woman writer.